Uh, Greg Salamando is one of our more recent appointees to the NIDA T32, and he's working with Greg Corder in his lab looking at, obviously, pain circuitry, and that's, of course, very close to our hearts in terms of OUD and endogenous opioids. And many of you will remember Greg Corder's lecture not so long ago, talking about using endogenous opioids as a way of disrupting pain circuits. The article that Greg has chosen today is talking about pain perception and how there may be some actual molecular signatures down at the really single uh, cell level, which is really pretty amazing, transcriptomics of the dorsal root ganglion. And basically, Greg, I think you have some slides here you want to go through, and welcome to today. Sure, yeah. Thank you very much, Dr. Chambers. So, uh, hey, everybody. So, thanks for taking a peek at this paper, if you were able to. Um, uh, like Dr. Chambers said, uh, we're going to be talking about this new translational medicine paper from Science that was focusing on using new transcript, uh, transcriptomic techniques to identify different populations of uh, sensory neurons within the dorsal root ganglia with the ultimate goal of using this work to look at conservation of expression markers and genetic signatures across species and hopefully utilize that to inform the development of various therapeutics downstream for the treatment of pain and other addictive disorders that are related to the use of chronic opioid abuse and things of that nature. Uh, so before we get into the bulk of the paper, I just want to move to the background for everybody, just on the basics of the biology, the methodology, and some of the other uh, little details that might be important in understanding this paper in total. So uh, one of the big techniques, obviously, that was utilized across this study was the implementation of this new kind of methodology in the field of RNA sequencing, known as spatial transcriptomics. So first, just to give anyone who's not um, acutely familiar with it uh, a quick description of how RNA what RNA sequencing is and how it works. So uh, this is uh, typically a description of a suite of technologies or methodologies that are used to assess specific markers or profiles within cell -like tissue or cell populations. Uh, and it can, it can be utilized to kind of uh, parse out and make these distinctions based on the profiles that can be gleaned from the bulk uh, mRNA signal or a single cell derived RNA mRNA signal, uh, signal profile. And this can kind of help you parse out differences in gene expression patterns and markers that are unique to either a bulk tissue uh, from a region of interest or to select single cell populations that can be uh, kind of dissected out from those uh, tissue types of interest that your lab or your research group might be wanting to investigate. So today we're going to be talking about um, spatial form of transcriptomics, but this is just a quick overview of how the generic workflow for an RNA sequencing assay can work. Uh, this is uh, provided from the company Tax Genomics, which uh, some people might be familiar with. They're kind of the more in vogue uh, commercial um, provider of technologies and reagents and kits for doing kind of quicker DIY transcriptomic based and RNA sequencing based analyses. But when you're looking at this at the level of single cell or bulk tissue, the idea is that what you're going to do is kind of parse out your either sample of single neurons, uh, I'm sorry, single cells or tissue and homogenize it in a way where you can then associate all these different kinds of cells uh, with these unique barcoded markers, uh, which in this case, uh, this example showing that it is in the form of beads that are marked with uh, hundreds of thousands of different kinds of uh, uh, trans, uh, mRNA uh, based oligomers, which can then bind to native mRNA transcripts that can be derived from either single cell or from bulk tissue. Uh, in the case of doing a single cell partition, what you end up having is a individual neuron that can be, uh, I'm sorry, an individual cell that can be kind of broken down and separated into some of these emulsion like beads that contain um, one of these barcoded spots or beads in it, uh, and they are also uh, selectively only containing a single cell. And so you can then break that down to have um, samples that you can collect and sort that have your single cells uh, within your uh, selective uh, emulsions. You can then break them down uh, and use them to bind to your uh, barcoded beads and generate a cDNA library, which you can then uh, uh, which you can then uh, uh, generate and uh, refine in order to you have a product that you can then push off for sequencing. Now, when we're talking about this, uh, the technique that was used in this paper, they didn't go a whole other way to do single cell based work. It's kind of something that, in their own words, was a bit more near single cell based work. And this was through the use of this uh, new kind of offshoot of the RNA sequencing field uh, known as spatial transcriptomics, which, as opposed to taking a bulk sample of tissue or a sample of single cells, like you saw in the previous example, 
and breaking those cells or that tissue down and utilizing the same RNA uh, sequencing uh, methodologies and technologies to assess the molecular profiles of that. Instead, what you're going to do here with the spatial transcriptomic techniques is kind of look at the expression profiles of all these different forms, uh, genes and mRNAs in a specific histological sample. So this kind of gives you the ability to look at where specific transcriptions and uh, genes are expressed within structures, uh, within um, kind of complex tissue or organ systems, as you can see them in like, let's say a histological slice that you take off of a microtome or a cryotome. So this kind of uh, class of mRNA sequencing techniques is really just uh, described by the spatial transcriptomics term, which is more just overarching terminology for a number of different methodologies used to assign cell types based on their RNA profiles. Uh, via their location, as I mentioned, a histological sample. Uh, this was initially introduced back in the early 2000s, what was initially described as spatial genomics. And from 2016 onward, this technique has been updated and refined to what we see now at the commercial level that companies like 10X Genomics and others provide kind of more out-the-box um, approaches for labs to jump into and start utilizing for their own questions and uh, for their own tissue types and regions of interest. And this can kind of be broken down further into five principle-based approaches that comprise how spatial transcriptomics is done today. Now, the first being, as you can see in the uh, cartoon on the right, uh, I'm sorry, on the left, is via the use of microdissection to remove the region of interest, uh, break it down or uh, lysis tissue and then sequence it. You can then have fluorescent in situ hybridization or FISH, which a number of people might be familiar with. Uh, there's also in situ sequencing, uh, in situ capture, and then in silico sequencing, which are all different variations, again, of ways to either have a fixed sample or uh, derive uh, samples from a fixed sam from a histological sample, have a more uh, spatially relevant representation of where these uh, markers are spread across that. And today's paper will primarily be focusing on the use of the IS capture and the fish-based uh, forms of spatial transcriptomics, and we'll get into that in just a little bit. Uh, so to give another quick overview of how this primary technique that really makes up the bulk of the data from the paper works is an in situ capture form of spatial transcriptomics. Uh, so this is kind of um, a suite again of technologies that have multiple variations on this overall method, but the primary goal is ultimately always the same, which is to isolate known tissue regions of interest and visualize RNA molecules via either hybridization based techniques or via sequencing by uh, uh, either taking those uh, marked samples out of the tissue or by it, analyzing it in tissue uh, with complement, complementing this with uh, microscopy-based techniques. You can see a quick breakdown of these different technologies over here on the left in this cartoon here. And as we mentioned, what we're gonna be looking at today is again more this method of looking at the placement or the uh, stratification of these markers in a fixed tissue sample. And so this other cartoon over here gives another breakdown of how this could be modified. Um, in order to look at this within a fixed sample that might be sitting um, uh, overlaying your barcoded beads that we kind of described a little bit earlier. And so today's paper uh, is gonna be utilizing this technique known as Visium. And to give everyone just a quick rundown of how that works, uh, here's some cartoons that were provided by the company Taxonomics to show the basic workflow for how this uh, in situ capture based technique works in their hands and how they provide their kits to laboratories to make use of. You can see you kind of work basically from the uh, starting point where you prep your tissue, it goes through a, a round of imaging, uh, barcoding and creating a cDNA library, finally into this uh, actual sequencing step that occurs at ex situ, and then last but not least, you have this data analysis and visualization step in which you're able to kind of look at where all your mRNA molecules uh, are lining up in your sample of interest, and you can analyze and visualize this data in a number of different ways. And this is just a quick refinement to just to show more or less the basic step-by-step uh, -step process that the uh, researchers used in the application of this technique in their study here. Uh, uh, in this case, they were using fresh tissue sample that was taken from human uh, donor patient uh, DRGs or dorsal root ganglias. And the basic process is as described in the bottom here where you have these uh, slides that are provided by the company, these Visium-based slides that have these uh, little um, rectangle regions that are filled out with all these barcoded dots or spots, uh, again, that have millions of different kinds of probes uh, that have complementary mRNA-based sequences on them to identify uh, many, many, many different types of uh, genes or different expression mark uh, genetic or molecular markers that might be present on the sample that overlays them. Uh, when the sample is adhered to the slide, uh, 
Uh, it again is overlaying all of these different spots or uh, barcoded uh, regions that are present on the slide. The tissue is impermeabilized to give access uh, to allow uh, both the uh, native mRNA from the sample to bind to these um, fixed uh, um, probes that are present on these different barcoded beads that are on the slide. Uh, following the release of the mRNA, it can then bind to the cognate regions that are present across all these barcodes. And from there, once uh, the barcoding and, and uh, binding is complete, you can go on to actually create and harvest your mRNA to generate your cDNA library, which after its construction can then be run through uh, standard sequencing-based methodologies. And then uh, finally, we did the creation of this visualization uh, using different kinds of proprietary softwares to see how your um, genetic markers or genes of interest stratify across your uh, sample that you've been looking at. And you can also represent this data in a number of different ways uh, in order to kind of look at and parse out interesting information from these high dimensional data sets. So when discussing uh, that, um, one, a couple of the last few things just about the methodology. Um, for some of you who may not have heard of this, if you haven't really been looking at or are familiar with high dimensional data sets that utilize uh, many different, uh, hundreds of thousands of different data points to analyze uh, gene expression values or other uh, such high dimensional data sets. Uh, one of the main, um, Kind of figures you might have seen across a number of the um, different sets of data that the researchers presented here uh, were shown in this formation, which is known as a UMAP, uh, which is short for a Uniform Manifold Approximation and Projection. So to kind of break it down very simply, a UMAP is, again, a way to kind of represent a very high dimensional data set, which has multiple uh, axes among which data can be analyzed and parsed out. Uh, but this is kind of reducing the dimensionality of this you know, 2D space for easy visual consumption and interpretation by readers and uh, anyone else who's looking at this data in general. And so ultimately the goal of a UMAP really is just to show how closely related or different certain data points are within different clusters uh, of data that can be parsed out of uh, whatever kinds of bits of analyses you want to perform on whatever kind of data you have. And the caveat here being that closer points that are located within the same cluster are usually more similar while clusters that are further apart from one another are more dissimilar. And this uh, little uh, breakdown over here uh, provided by this gentleman's blog actually does a pretty good job of showing how this kind of works. Uh, here he's showing uh, a UMAP in the form of a woolly mammoth and showing these different regions of the mammoth that have been parsed out by his um, hypothetical algorithm. You can see that when this is now presented in a UMAP form, you can see that all these different regions that are related to different specific uh, body parts of the mammoth have been parsed into these different clusters that are obviously more closely related to one another based on what part of the body they are located in. And you can think of this in the same way of how data for what we're going to be talking about in relation to sensory neurons in the DRG are parsed out. Uh, again, with the caveats being that closely clustered points are more similar, separate clusters are more different. And the data is grouped in this manner to kind of help it help us to more easily digest these large and complex data sets. And the last thing uh, on just the idea of generating UMAPs and visualizing this data, um, you might have noticed if any of you kind of peeked through the methods or looked into the text of the paper, uh, the authors mentioned that they made use of this R statistical package called SERAT. And a lot of these UMAPs are generated using this um, package nowadays, again, because it's uh, freeware that's offered through the R statistical software suite. Uh, Surratt itself was specifically developed by the TGO Lab uh, over in New York uh, back in 2015. It's been going strong ever since with a number of different people utilizing them and enhancing and improving this uh, package. And essentially, it's just a uh, plugin and tool based package that allows you to run these statistical, uh, uh, complex statistical analyses on these data sets. And uh, for anyone who might be wondering, the Surratt name comes from the French painter Georges Pierre uh, Surratt mainly because of his development of the pointillism style of painting. And if you look at a lot of these UMAPs and you got kind of formation for all of them within these clusters, that was kind of a cute little thing that the researchers in uh, the Satija lab uh, did for naming it. Kind of how we get to have fun on the preclinical uh, pre side of things, I guess, sometimes. Uh, so the last couple of things before just doing a quick background of some of the biology, uh, the other method that I mentioned that was utilized in this paper for doing spatial transcriptomics was uh, just generic fish. Uh, in this case, it's an enhanced form of fluorescent in situ hybridization known as RNA scope. And this functions very similarly to standard fish, um, the methodology by which you have the cDNA probes that are designed to tag uh, mRNA transcript species with very high specificity in preps from tissue regions of interest. Uh, again, RNA scope, which is a proprietary uh, 
form of fish provided by the company ACD Bio uh, is a way of doing uh, this, but uh, they propose that this uh, kind of methodology and the chemistry that they have developed that makes use of these um, D probes, as they call them, uh, allows a greater level of specificity, amplification, and visualization of single transcript species within your uh, cell types or your tissue types of interest. So, again, this is more of a proprietary form of fish that kind of takes a lot of the guesswork out of how you design probes and produce them uh, out of the hands of researchers, uh, both in the clinical and preclinical side of things. Essentially, it's just going to help us visualize where specific uh, genetic markers or mRNA transcript markers of interest are within cell types and samples. The last couple of things uh, before we get into the data, just for anyone who is not super familiar with some of the pain biology and the impetus for doing this work uh, that uh, Dr. Childress kind of led into with her introduction. So the main focus of this study is, again, I'm looking at the dorsal root ganglia uh, of humans uh, and specifically human uh, tissue samples and trying to make uh, distinctions about the kinds of sensory neurons that are usually clustered within them. Uh, so the DRG itself uh, is just that, it's a cluster of neurons that are located just outside of the spinal cord, and they usually contain the cell bodies of the majority of the peripheral nervous system sensory neurons. And uh, typically they project uh, afferent fibers that ascend along the spinal tract uh, up into the brainstem and then finally into the CNS to relay important sensory information about the outside world to the CNS itself. And this uh, typically is uh, deemed in the sense of pain, the ascending pain pathway, and a lot of other forms, it's also deemed as a spinothalamic tract. So the DRG themselves, as I mentioned, they are known to house the cell bodies of a number of these different forms of sensory neurons, with the predominant ones being the uh, mechano uh, receptors, which are usually uh, simplified to being able to detect differences in stretch and pressure felt externally by the skin and other body organs. Uh, proprioceptors, which are involved in sensing position of the body. These are typically uh, found in different muscles, joints, and other areas of the body where uh, positioning and uh, kind of uh, stretch and other forms of that need to be determined to figure out where your limbs and other regions are in space. And finally, the nociceptors, which is of keen interest to the researchers uh, that performed this study. And these are typically believed to be the uh, receptor types that are important for detecting different forms of noxious stimuli, uh, specifically uh, so things such as pain, different te temperatures and noxious heat. But there is also evidence to suggest that some of these uh, receptors can also detect differences in pleasurable um, sensations. Uh, so to break it down even further, uh, before um, just finishing up some of this background, um, again, uh, these sensory neurons can be divided into a number of different classes, not only based on their afferent fibers that we discussed before, uh, but also based on the uh, receptor subtype that makes them up, as well as differences in their patterns of responses to different kinds of stimuli that are felt through different form, uh, different areas of the uh, body in terms of the organs that they might be innervating, as well as more predominantly within the external skin that they innervate. So the mechanical receptors specifically could be broken down into the miser corpuscles and Merkel cells, Ruffini corpuscles, and Passini, uh, pa Passini corpuscles. The nociceptors are usually believed to be naked nerve endings. Uh, these are the C and alpha delta, A, A delta fibers. And the proprioceptors, uh, just a quick kind of uh, sampling of them, usually be felt to be um, some of these receptors such as the muscle spindle fibers, Golgi tendon organs, and joint receptors as well. You can see in the cartoons on the left that there's a nice little breakdown in both of them over where and how and what these um, different kinds of uh, sensory neurons are represented as and how they can respond to different kinds of stimuli that is present both in the CNS and at the level of the skin as well. And so uh, just to give a quick breakdown, two of these fiber classes uh, that are also important in uh, determining how the information from the sensory neurons can be transduced and that play a role in defining them and distinguishing them based on morphology. Uh, the uh, fibers can be broken down again into four classes as well. Uh, the A-alpha fibers, which are typically thought to uh, primarily come from proprioceptors. They are able to provide very fast transduction of information, and they're usually the thickest in diameter as well. Uh, the alpha, the A-beta uh, fibers then make up um, a lot of the afferents coming from the macau receptors, uh, as well as some nociceptors, and they provide uh, middling to fast transduction of information, and they're a bit uh, thinner in their diameter than the very thick A alphas. The A deltas are next, and these are primarily thought to make up and comprise nociceptor subclasses, particularly those that are involved in noxious stimuli and noxious pain, uh, thermal pain sensation, and they have a bit of slower transduction compared to the other two classes. 
And then lastly, we have these C fibers, which are primarily nose receptors, and its receptors are uh, pyrogenic receptors as well. And these are typically naked nerve fibers, which without that myelin sheathing around them, don't allow them to transduce information very rapidly. So they're the slowest uh, of the four. And so lastly, um, just to kind of give everyone a quick uh, understanding of some of the terminology that we might be seeing coming up later, this study was, of course, based uh, out of a lot of work that has been done extensively, preclinically, using uh, different mammalian models, specifically rodents and macaques and other monkeys and other non-human primates, to identify and select genetic markers of specific sensory neuronal subclasses. So a lot of this uh, transcriptomic work has been going on for a long time using uh, my, uh, mouse and rodent models as well as um, other non-human primate models. And a lot of these studies, like the one you can see uh, displayed in the lower left here, have utilized this information to give us some basic ideas of where we might believe uh, certain genetic markers might be found across different types of sensory neurons uh, within these different model organisms. And here is a quick example of that. Um, we'll see some of this terminology come up a little bit later in the paper, but within the preclinical field, particularly those who are working with mice, uh, studying with DRG and pain specifically, there are a couple of different subtypes of receptor of uh, classifications that have been developed. Uh, here you can see a kind of uh, example of some of them. We have this PEP1, 2, MP, NF1, NF2, and NF3 classes that are defined by specific genetic markers, as you can see on the right here, uh, and by the presence of specific other kinds of markers, either them being peptidergic or neuropeptidergic receptors or neuropeptidergic species, or the absence of some of these species. Um, they can also be defined by the makeup of the fibers and by the response and uh, sensory type of neurons that are thought to be um, making up these classes, which can be determined via a number of different uh, methods histologically, uh, and we'll kind of discuss those a little bit when we get into the bulk of the text next. So the authors here, uh, just to give everyone a quick background on them, so the main leads on this from the preclinical or biomedical side of things were uh, the team of Theodore Price and Greg Dusor from uh, University of Texas, Dallas. Uh, these guys are the co-heads of the uh, pain research group there at UT Dallas, and they've been in the game both preclinically and now delving into some more clinical human studies for a long time with extensive work both in uh, rodent and cell modeling of different forms of pain and uh, trying to understand the neurobiology and physiology of pain. They were also joined in this work by Dr. Rob Giroux from uh, Washington University in St. Louis, who's another big pain and itch specialist, primarily in the uh, preclinical arena as well, but he's also been making the leap over to the clinical side of things in the pursuit of more therapeutically relevant data from his animal model work. Uh, and lastly, they were aided by uh, Dr. Jeffrey C. Reese from the Southwest Transplant Alliance, who primarily helped with the sourcing and the uh, acquisition of the tissue from the uh, donor patients uh, from his practice. And so this kind of leads us into the primary question that we're going to try and discuss in terms of all the work that we've kind of set up with, uh, with the background and with a quick insight into the interests and the background of the uh, researchers here. Uh, this kind of led to the primary questions that the study sought to kind of address, which is based out of the idea of whether or not it's possible to use a lot of these techniques that are common in preclinical biological and biomedical work to analyze human sample uh, tissue samples to glean whether or not you can compare the results that have been generated from animal model RNA-seq analyses of nociceptors and other sensory neurons within the DRG to see how similar or dissimilar they are to human patient samples, as well as whether or not this kind of work can help to identify molecular targets in human tissue for the development of novel therapeutics uh, that may aid in manipulating um, these different kinds of sensory neuron subtypes and kind of offer an alternative to a lot of the standard pain-based medications that are on the market right now, such as the opioids, which we know present with a slew of problems as well for a number of different patient populations. So here, uh, quickly, is just a breakdown of the uh, donor information. Um, this was, uh, these were all uh, collected from patients uh, post-mortem after they had um, expired and had already agreed to allow to have their tissue um, uh, collected and utilized in these kinds of biomedical studies. And you can kind of see a quick breakdown of different factors, such as the age of each of these patients, the sex, the race, and the cause of death in general. Uh, primarily uh, of interest to us, there is a fairly good spread of sex differences, uh, different sexes across these studies with a pretty decent and equal representation of both tissue from male and females, which the researchers will make use of and will address uh, uh, later in some of the figures. 
Uh, the age demographic was a bit all over the place, not as uniform in general. Uh, there's fairly decent spread, but not too decent spread of uh, racial uh, backgrounds that were sourced uh, primarily with uh, white being the main source. And then the cause of death um, was also somewhat varied as well. And we'll address some of these things when we talk about uh, the overall findings of the paper at the end. Uh, so moving into the main figures now and going over the work that was conducted by these, uh, this group when they actually had these uh, human VRGs in hand. Uh, here we can first see a quick cartoon that shows a breakdown of the overall workflow and the analysis methodologies utilized. And this kind of mirrors what we saw earlier in the background where we were discussing the Visium technique and how it works. Uh, but briefly, uh, you know, what was uh, what occurred was within a four hour window after cross clamping and the tissue had been uh, uh, harvested from the human patient donors, uh, this tissue was then mounted onto these Visium slides. It was then stained with uh, A and E staining in order to serve as a counter stain method for uh, identifying where the um, different kinds of neurons and other kinds of surrounding material were overlapping uh, on the um, bead probes when they were placed into these Visium slides. And then the standard workflow that described that was described earlier was basically followed with uh, the tissue being aligned over these different beads, the tissue being permeabilized in order to allow the mRNA transcripts to leave the samples and then get into a form where it could be harvested to generate a cDNA library. And then finally, the generation of a um, suite of different kinds of analyses that allowed us to partition and break down and view these different genetic profiles that were determined for all these uh, neurons across these human DRG samples. And so quickly down here, just to give you a brief background from some of the supplement and how this distinction was made uh, for the overall barcoding selection criteria and gene dis uh, detection distribution overall across these samples. You can kind of see here a representative patch of tissue that was, um, a, I believe this is a 40 or 20 times zoom uh, of the uh, tissue region that was uh, mounted on one of these Visium sections. And you can see that what the researchers did was they tried to see where in the slice uh, neurons that were denoted by these um, eosin, um, I'm sorry, by the uh, hematoxylin stain here uh, overlapped with uh, some of these different barcoding beads, whether or not there were surrounding regions near the neuron that overlapped with some specific beads and then an area outside that wasn't really close to or even proximal to one of these neuronal cell bodies or nuclei in this case that was identified. And they parse these into these different categories uh, being the neuronal barcodes that directly overlap, the surrounding barcodes that were proximal but not directly overlapping with the uh, nuclei that denoted some of these neurons in these slices, and these other barcodes that were just somewhere else off in the extracellular matrix region that are not either close to the nuclei or potentially close to the cytoplasm of these neurons. And finally, here you can see a nice distribution and how they were able to actually analyze uh, these uh, specific features and uh, basically what they were getting from their um, uh, selected barcoding um, criteria to see how many uh, genes of interest and other specific R uh, RNA species of interest were overlapping with them. And you can see that there's fairly good uh, and selective distribution within the uh, neuronal barcodes selectively and that they were also able to kind of make the uh, distinction uh, different profiling determinations based off of the surround and others that they could then parse out that were separate uh, from the neuronal profiles specifically. Uh, and lastly, here's a quick uh, example of some of the tissue staining and how this looked when they uh, did this. Uh, we kind of covered this briefly in the last slide, but just again, um, this is kind of basically what their sections ended up looking like when they placed them on these museum slides. I to give a quick background on how the tissue was collected and what uh, predominantly form it was in. This was fresh tissue that was snap frozen and stored at minus 20 until it was sectioned of the cryotome and then placed onto the slide, uh, either for the Visium spatial transcriptomic processing or in superfrost uh, charged slides for RNA scope analysis. Uh, again, we mentioned the e and HD staining, which allowed them to separate out uh, uh, neuronal nuclei from extracellular matrix cytoplasm for these different cells of interest. And then lastly, I'll also mention, and we'll discuss this in uh, a few slides when we get to the figure that's relevant here, but they also use some of this tissue that they collected from these human DRGs to create cult neuronal cultures of these DRG sensory neurons that they utilize for ex vivo electrophysiology. But again, I'll get to that in just a slide or two. Uh, so moving on to the data that they started to mine from this after they ran the Visium technique, 
and start to do all their sequencing on the markers that they were able to derive um, uh, from the human DRGs. Uh, here, what you could see is a breakdown of those clusters that we described before when we're looking at some of these UMAP-based databases. Uh, and specifically, what the researchers mentioned is that they were able to identify 16 unique neuronal clusters. And you can kind of see them all numbered here, uh, each uh, identified also by a distinct color to show that they are different and to show how separate and uh, overlapping some of these different groups may or may not be, depending on where they're represented in spatial, uh, spatially within this UMAP. And they made these distinctions for these uh, distinct clusters based on the identification of specific genetic markers that were informed from preclinical literature, again, from work that has been done in rodent models, as well as macaque models, as well as a little bit of uh, literature that has come from uh, some human work as well. And these uh, markers, again, are defined above all of these smaller UMAPs here with the gene of interest, uh, again, with some of them uh, being shown uh, here and knowing to have um, long-standing uh, involvement in uh, denoting specific sensory and DRG neuron subtypes. Uh, specifically, uh, I can point out the examples like the TREC3 and the TREC2 receptors here, uh, which are typically known to be neurotropic factors that um, delineate specific forms of sensory neurons uh, as they're undergoing development and um, actually becoming mature sensory neurons in the PNS. Uh, but essentially, this was uh, the main takeaway from this figure is that you could see kind of how they were able to utilize these different markers, specifically determine and inform how they were going to cluster a number of these initial um, uh, groups of specific sensory neural subtypes that they wanted to then um, more uh, discreetly and uh, selectively dissect in order to figure out if there are other unique markers that were present within them that can help define different kinds of molecular profiles for these uh, sensory neural subtypes of interest. Uh, here as well, we can see how this um, work was refined a little bit further and how the distribution of these a priori uh, determined genetic markers were showing up across these different clusters. And here below, I've just made a quick list of how they were finally defining these 12 ultimate clusters that they were able to kind of parse out from this larger data set. So here you can see that uh, the first cluster that we'll see and that we saw numbered uh, previously, but was we'll numbered again in the next slide, uh, correspond more to these proprioceptor sensory neurons. Group two uh, corresponds to these A-beta slow adapting or SA low threshold mechanoreceptors. Three uh, corresponds to A-beta rapid adapting uh, LTMRs. Four, a delta LTMRs. Uh, five to the A beta nociceptors, uh, six to these cold nociceptors, uh, seven to these A delta high threshold mechanoreceptors, six to a population that expressed this uh, gene proencephaly, and were also um, determined to have other markers that were indicative of nociceptors. Nine were these transient receptor uh, potential cation uh, channel subfamily A, member one, trip A1 nociceptors. Ten were these so called silent nociceptors. 11 were these peridogenic receptors that are known to uh, transduce information related to itch. And then lastly, in group 12, we have our C uh, low, uh, low uh, threshold mechanical receptors. And so here we can see the refinement of their work uh, previously shown in, earlier in figure one, uh, down to these final 12 defined uh, human DRG neuronal clusters. Again, with the uh, information that I just described in the previous slide, uh, overlaying each of these groups, uh, showing how they were able to parse them out. And uh, of note that they uh, saw when they did some more refined analysis of these clusters within their uh, data set, they noted that there was an equal contribution from all of the donor tissue into all of these defined classes. So again, uh, basically what that is just saying is that there was no one group that was defined selectively from just one donor's uh, tissue alone uh, that had such a high number of uniquely defined markers that created its own kind of cluster like this. No, but uh, on the whole, pretty much uh, samples that were derived from every single donor across all sexes uh, were able to actually contribute to the generation of all of these clusters, showing that there's equal distribution of these different sensory uh, markers, uh, sensory neuronal markers, and the DRGs of these patients across all sample types. Uh, they also know that there was con uh, consistent distribution of detected genes and mRNA molecules across all of these clusters that were also denoted by the uh, marker SNAP25, which was what they utilized to define neurons specifically within this data set. Uh, 
Uh, so again, they saw that there was e equal distribution of specific markers across all of these different um, uh, overall clusters that they were uh, identifying, and that the majority of them were neuronal in nature. So again, this kind of helped uh, give them confidence that they were actually able to see a nice unique profile that was more um, uh, complete from, and that was derived from an equal um, contribution from all their um, sample, sample tissue of interest. Uh, so here, now moving on, when they took a finer comb to these different clusters, they then wanted to look across them and see if there were other unique um, molecular markers of interest that could help define a specific uh, transcriptomic-like profile for each of these cell types to give them a better understanding of what kind of receptors of interest, uh, what kind of genes of interest might make them up. It might serve as both markers for their uh, functional definition of these different cell types that they have defined in their study, but also potentially inform the expression patterns of selective receptors or other kinds of markers that have classically been associated with pain and, uh, and uh, sensory-based neurons to help give them an idea of what might be unique and might be different from human data when they compare it later on to uh, data that's been gleaned from both mass and uh, non-human primate models. So here you can see a breakdown of the overall expression and the um, overall percent expression of these different kinds of genetic markers that are running along the x-axis here uh, across all these different groups. You can see the cross comparison uh, within some of the other 12 clusters that they defined. Uh, here, what we're seeing uh, in these uh, different graphs, the dots here that are uh, corresponding to the expression uh, patterns of these different genes of interest in each sub uh, type that's represented on the right here are defined by the size, which a larger size uh, indicates that there's a larger percentage of uh, samples from this subtype that were expressing this marker of interest. And then the scale of expression denoted by the color or the hue uh, of each of these dots is indicated by an increasing um, intensity of blue or purple color uh, along a scale of negative one to two, with uh, zero and negative one being low expression with the two um, value, uh, arbitrary value being uh, able to determine a greater expression overall. And as you can see, they were able to den denote uh, specific markers of interest and specific um, genetic um, uh, genes that seem to show unique expression patterns across these 12 clusters that they were able to pull out from their sequencing analyses. And this kind of extends across all the other um, six subtypes that uh, were mentioned previously. And from this, they were actually able to then kind of parse out um, specifically known pain genes and see how well this mapped onto these different clusters of uh, sensory neural subtypes they were able to define within this study. And again, these are uh, genes that have been uh, classically associated both in human and uh, preclinical models uh, with specifically different forms of sensory neurons or different forms of nociceptors um, and that have a uh, long history both in clinical and preclinical data of denoting this. Uh, here I noted a couple of interest on the bottom of this x-axis here uh, with one being TRIPV1 which are typically um, uh, which is a, a gene that's known to encode a sensor that's typically been uh, implicated in detecting differences in noxious temperature both in rodent and uh, across uh, human models as well. Uh, CALCA-C here is also known to encode the gene CGRP, which anyone who might be studying or interested in migraines or the uh, biology of migraines know it plays a large role in driving the kind of pain profile and prolonged kind of effects uh, of migraine-like um, events. And then uh, finally, just uh, making, making a little note of another uh, mechanoreceptor or uh, gene that encodes uh, specific mechanoreceptor like uh, proteins, uh, piezo one which was uh, previously recently implicated in, in some uh, more high profile work uh, in the preclinical field um, with, group, uh, with groups out at uh, UC South, uh, San Francisco that involved the, I believe, the conferral of a Nobel Prize. Uh, so aside from looking at these known uh, pain genes and these markers, they also want to see if they could make some distinctions on the sizes of these different uh, neurons or cell nuclei uh, based on measurements of the overall diameter of these uh, neuro, uh, cell, uh, cell bodies that they were able to visualize on these Visium slides. Again, uh, as noted earlier, the size and diameter of all these fibers and the size of these cell types can often be utilized as a proxy for determining uh, what kinds of uh, sensory neurons you're looking at in a DRG sample. And here, they're just showing a breakdown of the overall 
diameters that they were able to use and measure uh, using a micro microscope based imaging software and a, a measurement tool within that software to kind of gauge the overall diameter of these different cell bodies of nuclei that were able, uh, that were defining some of these uh, specific uh, marked subtypes of neurons. And you can kind of see these Gaussian curve fits show the overall frequency that these diameters were measured within specific subtypes and what kind of um, barcode profile was associated with these kind of measured uh, diameters of cells. And this uh, is just a quick breakdown again of how they determined those uh, profiles uh, and uh, kind of compartmentalized them across all their 12 clusters to gain these kind of specific patterns that they were able to then kind of overlay onto these different analyses in order to help them further have some confidence in determining what kind of markers they were looking at. So um, moving on now. So now that they have kind of developed these kind of profiles that they could use this uh, Visium based software and this Visium based analysis to look at, they wanted to have a more refined um, way of t checking out and determining that indeed these profiles that they were getting all this bulk data for from the uh, sequencing based work uh, were, did have some traction if they were looking at samples again with a different form of in situ based hybridization to see if a number of these uh, really high profile markers showed up across cells when they tried to visualize them uh, using fluorescent in situ hybridization. Uh, so again, this was just another form of verification for them to show that some of the markers and uh, these profiles that they were starting to work up for these different subtypes of cells did actually replicate when they utilized another method. And the method that they are going to use for this, uh, as we mentioned earlier, uh, was this form of enhanced fish known as RNA scope. Uh, so here in these first two, uh, first three early uh, uh, components of figure three, what they're showing here uh, is the expression percentages across their 12 groups for a number of genes that they selected to assess via RNA scope. In this case, uh, the uh, six or seven or so genes at, at the bottom here are labeled on the x-axis that had very high expression profiles or unique expression profiles across these different kinds of subtype clusters that they were able to parse out. And that have been known via literature based data to actually uh, correlate very well with some of these um, determined subtypes that they were able to find from their human samples. Uh, here, what they're showing is the total percentage of neurons that, when they ran their RNA scope based analyses, they were actually able to target and show positive signal for when they ran some of these uh, mRNA based probes uh, on their tissue sample. And you can see that there's a relatively high rate of success for all of these probes in marking at least a number of cells uh, across their different uh, sample types that they ran uh, this analysis on. Uh, again, indicated that they were fairly on the money when they were able to identify a number of these markers and work up some of these different profiles. And finally, they showed how this distribution uh, of markers uh, aligned with a number of these cell types that they again determined by this uh, diameter or size uh, distribution kind of parse out uh, different kinds of profiles of neurons via that kind of uh, more uh, qualitative based metric. And again, there seemed to be high consistency and overlap with some of these predefined groups and marker uh, and cell types based uh, on diameter metrics that could also be marked with unique uh, uh, markers via RNA scope that were also shown to kind of correlate with these subtypes uh, as gleaned from their uh, Visium based analysis. So here we're just going to quickly go through uh, some of the uh, sample images that they took from their RNA scope based studies. And so here you can kind of see all of these are going to have these inserts where we're seeing, I believe, a 20 uh, times magnified image of uh, one of these um, sections of human DRG. They were staining with these different uh, cDNA transcript probes um, using RNA scope. And then the insert above here is showing a 40 times magnified image of one of these specific uh, DR DRG sensory neurons. Uh, just a higher level of definition so that you could see how the um, distribution of all the staining using these probes uh, looked across these different kinds of individual cells. And so here, um, what we're seeing, we're looking across uh, some of these different domains or uh, different cell domains that they were able to define. They did seem to show a number, a pretty decent overlap with a number of these different markers that they had uh, initially hypothesized based off of their uh, Visium results would overlap with some of these uh, different kinds of markers of sensory neurons across these different groups. Uh, they also noted that they were able to utilize other kinds of uh, higher profile uh, pain related genes um, to kind of parse out and define some of these groups. 
and they were also able to see them in a number of different clusters uh, in their previous uh, analyses, and that these also replicated and copied over into some of their in situ based studies here, where they were trying to see if these markers again indeed showed up at some of these different cell types of interest. So this extended again to um, different classes of cells as well that made up uh, all of these different kinds of subtypes. Uh, again, when looking at some of these other specific uh, uh, markers that they showed were enriched in different kinds of classes, such as the uh, nociceptors and these uh, lothrosome account receptors, uh, A beta, A delta, and C fiber uh, defined uh, based nociceptors and account receptors. They did show very nice overlap with a number of these markers and these uh, presumed or putative cell types that they believed would go with, uh, that they believed could be partitioned from previously uh, defined uh, subtype clusters. So moving on from this, the last thing they also wanted to do to give themselves some confidence uh, that they were indeed able to identify some of these uh, unique um, subtypes based off their molecular or transcriptomic profile uh, was to utilize um, uh, was to utilize uh, ex vivo electrophysiology, uh, something that I touched on briefly before. Uh, and here, what they were basically doing was just patching on the cells and then applying a agonist that is known to depolarize, uh, specifically in this case, these trip V1 uh, expressing cells, uh, this being capsaicin, to see if they actually did fire either an action potential or show a depolarization event, which is something that you typically expect these cells to do. Uh, and in most cases, they showed that indeed when they looked at the subtype of cells that they defined. Uh, and stained for, uh, and were able to uh, identify via the TRIP-V1 gene expressed on them, these cells did indeed uh, respond to capsaicin. Again, showing that they could, with high confidence, uh, partition out and identify these cells based on the transcriptomic and molecular profile that they were able to work out from them. So here, this is just a quick breakdown uh, of them comparing the results, the previous results, and once again, showing that there was additional validation of their visium based technique um, when they compared it to other studies that had also used RNA scope and other methodologies to look at, at transcriptional profiles and molecular markers uh, within in situ samples. Uh, again, showing that the new methodology and the refined methodology that they used did have some overlap with these previous data sets, but also revealed some other interesting distinctions from them that potentially these past um, analyses were not uh, high powered enough to actually parse out. Uh, so moving on, uh, we'll quickly try and get through the next couple figures uh, just so we can get to the end. Uh, this uh, next figure four kind of goes through their attempts to parse out their data based on sex differences. And in this case, they were interested, uh, since they had such a wide range of samples provided to them from their patient donors that span both the male and female sex, they wanted to see if there were any differences in the genetic expression profiles of some of these uh, neuronally defined uh, sensory, neuro sensory neuron markers from the DRGs they're either unique to human or uh, they're either unique to male or female patients. And here you can kind of see a uh, breakdown when they analyzed uh, their initial 12 clusters based on sex. They showed that there was very nice equal distribution of all of these markers across uh, from each uh, patient, from each uh, male and female sex group across all of them. Again, uh, indicating that there was no uniquely male or uniquely female based uh, group of data that was parsed out of here. Uh, they also know that when they performed their initial analysis to try and see if they could parse out any uh, differentially expressed genes just on the basis of male and female, uh, but on the basis of sex, when looking at this data collectively, they didn't really see too, too many that were falling out, around 44 or so that were neurally related uh, that they were able to parse out uh, from that kind of more broad analysis of the work. Now, however, they noted that if they started to break this uh, down specifically by the different subtypes and the different transcriptional profiles that they had defined for these uh, 12 subtypes or clusters of neurons, they were actually able to pull out a greater number of differences across um, both the uh, male and female sex when they were looking at um, these different kinds of profiles. So here uh, in the um, final couple figures for four, what they're showing is a breakdown of each group here, their 12 clusters again, analyzed uh, on the basis of sex. And what they were able to note was that in this uh, proteogenic uh, receptor enriched group, they were actually able to show a pretty high number of differentially expressed genes that fell out from the male and female data sets. Uh, specifically, um, when they ran gene ontology and other analyses, this also seemed to align with differences or different profiles uh, of uh, genes and uh, information that was relevant to these periogenic based receptor subtypes. And here is just kind of a quick breakdown of all the differentially expressed genes that they were able to find uh, 
across this, uh, specifically within this paragenic and rich group. Uh, specifically, they know that the calcogene was actually the calcogene was very very high in females compared to males, uh, and that this was validated based off of the barcoding results that they showed uh, in their visium analyses and off of some of the patient analyses work that they did with their fluorescent C2 hybridization. Again, giving them some confidence that this was indeed a real and unique and interesting finding, and that they were able to identify when looking at this at the basis of sex. Uh, so, in the last two figures, um, what they did was take the uh, extent, let the last logical extension of this data set, uh, in my opinion, which was now that they've done a lot of defining these molecular profiles in human patient samples, they wanted to see if, how well this compared to rodent and macaque patient uh, uh, macaque groups and data sets that already existed for analyzing similar um, DRG based centering neuron populations. So here, what we're seeing is just a quick breakdown and comparison of their own data, uh, parsed again by their 12 subtypes, uh, in comparison to data going from this um, uh, open source um, transcriptomic based data set for mass brain analyses, um, this being this massbrain.org. And what they noted was that when they started to look across uh, a number of different specific uh, classes of genes that define a number of these um, sensory neuron based subtypes, Specifically here, when they're looking at these uh, genes that encode voltage-gated sodium channels, which are known to play a large role in, in the transduction of information within their receptor and other sensory neurons. Uh, they noticed that there were, of course, uh, specific differences and specific similarities between the mass and the human data set. Uh, specifically here, they noted that there is a very uh, high uh, difference in the expression patterns of this uh, box SCN4 uh, beta gene, uh, B gene, which is known to encode a specific subtype uh, in the uh, NAV 1.8 uh, receptor that's known to play a role in transducing different forms of um, uh, neurological signals that may be involved in the transduction of pain profiles. And uh, one other note quickly, just on this data set here, um, you'll see this metric uh, on the side uh, known as entropy. Uh, this was a, a just kind of a arbitrary definition that they utilized to look at the specificity of one of the specific genes of interest one of the subtypes that they were defining either both in the human samples and the mouse samples uh, with a score of zero meaning that it is specific to one subtype and very unique to a score of one that you usually indicate that there was more of a uniform distribution of this gene across all these different subtypes uh, so here they also uh, were interested in looking at uh, the gp protein couple receptor family of genes um, at least as many as they could identify across these two uh, data sets to see if there are any differences in the overall expression patterns in both mouse and human samples. Uh, and what they noticed was that there were some unique differences, particularly in a couple of genes as noted here. And um, that of course, while they didn't do an exhaustive comparison and kind of left a lot of this data uh, open source for people to mine through and look through, they of course wanted to note that this data could potentially aid in the identification of some novel therapeutic targets, uh, GPCRs and other kinds of receptor type classes be prime targets for pharmacological manipulation uh, and intervention. And in addition to this, there were a number of other um, families of genes that they analyzed uh, across the mass of the human uh, data sets here that they have much further and more elegant breakdowns of in their supplement. And so lastly, with the final figure, um, this was looking for uh, orthogonal uh, expression patterns now between not only the, not just the human data sets, but between macaque data sets to take this to the highest order model that we typically are able to work with preclinically and see if there were unique differences or diversions in the expression of a number of these genes when comparing these two data sets. Uh, so here, this data set was derived from a so-called smart seek analysis that was done uh, by the um, group um, described above in this uh, paper from 2021. Overall, they were able to look at uh, 111 different DRG genes that had high dimensional resolution from that data set uh, when they, and compare it to their data set here, looking at human expression patterns. They parsed that down further to about 91 genes and then generated these claudograms to kind of more, um, I guess, a more intuitively, I guess, in their opinion, uh, show the similarities and differences between different subtypes of these uh, different sensory neuronal populations as defined by specific markers, both in the humans, uh, what they're saying here, and in the macaque, uh, based on the uh, work done by this previous paper. And so ultimately, they were able to see a number of different uh, conserved expression patterns across a number of these different groups that they were able to define with their analysis here. 
However, they uh, also noted some uh, unique and specific distinctions in the expression patterns of select genes across uh, different kinds of uh, A-beta and different kinds of C, uh, low and high threshold mechanoreceptors that may or may not be indicative of differences in um, evolutionary uh, divergences that could occur both in humans and macaques, but also that might help to kind of enhance the idea that there is very unique uh, human expression profiles of a number of these genes that may or may not be present in a number of these model systems that we typically tend to use uh, when we're doing a lot of our work um, in the uh, bench uh, at the bench. So, uh, sorry for uh, rushing there at the end and not leaving too, too much time for discussion, but uh, briefly, I just wanted to go over the overall conclusions that were derived from this study. Uh, so, ultimately, uh, the researchers believe that they were able to show that these uh, spatial transatomic based technologies uh, represent powerful tools for doing molecular profiling and human tissue samples, which, as we know, are very difficult and hard to talk by. Uh, they were also able to notice key differences and similarities between human mouse and macaque and DRG uh, sensory neuron genes by mining different data sets and comparing them with their own analyses here. Uh, particularly when uh, looking at the identification of convergent and different expressions for pharmacological evolving targets, they believe they've created a very nice uh, data set that people can mine through further in order to find different markers or different subtypes um, of receptors that define uh, these different neuronal markers that could potentially be druggable in the future. Uh, and lastly, something that I thought was very interesting from this was that they were able to use this work to kind of, in their own words, potentially take a first step in changing the idea of how drug development inquiry and work goes by working from human-based data sets first, but potentially going back to do further preclinical uh, pre research to de-risk drug discovery research. Uh, and lastly, there are just a couple critiques and limitations of this work that the uh, authors noted themselves, specifically uh, that this was not really single-cell based work, but kind of close to it. Uh, that they did some arbitrary work when determining how the barcoding worked that they could have kind of improved on. Uh, of course, the patient samples that they were deriving a lot of their um, tissue from to work with uh, were kind of just you know, based on what they were able to get. Uh, they weren't really able to just find what they were able to get from their um, collaborators, again, considering how rare and difficult it is to come across this. But they might have an eye to see if they could selectively choose from patients with chronic pain or addiction-based pathologies, uh, specifically to opioids, in order to further this work in a more clinically relevant manner. Uh, and then these were just a couple quick techniques that we don't need to get into uh, critiques that I just had, just of the presentation of the data and how they kind of parse, uh, kind of glazed over different ways to kind of define what they were doing in their figures. And so I'll end with these couple questions that we don't need to really go through, but we can touch them and questions that people might have. Um, basically, just in my own opinions of what this kind of work could mean for how we think about doing preclinical research and having it defined and informed from human-based data sets. Now, the technology might be advanced to the point where we can get this information and how it can maybe help shape and change the way that drug development research is done and potentially how academic and clinical research is done to complement this in order to help us better define ways define targets and different profiles for examining and studying these different kinds of uh, classes of cells. That was terrific, Greg. I so appreciate it. And actually, uh, it was a big bonus since I think much of your audience probably is not spending daily thought in single scale, uh, single scale, cell scale transcriptomics, but you were able to give us not only the data from this paper, but a background that helped us hang on by our fingernails to understand the overall thrust. And, and your discussion points were actually, when I was making notes for myself on this paper, just the big from a thousand feet or 2000 feet kind of view, it's, it, it would seem to caution, right, about translation in a, in a uh, certainly transcriptome to transcriptome way from rodents to macaques to humans. And yet, of course, for lots of reasons, much of the pain work is done in in animals first. And so this is really, I think, it's, it's very important because this is extremely elegant. The technology is extraordinary. I can barely hang on by my fingernails. But I think uh, the big question is the one that you've actually sort of raised here. What does it mean about our emphasis in terms of translation? Because I know NIH has been preoccupied with different kinds of poor translation from different kinds of animal models to humans? And is this another area where we're going to face difficulty? 
Yeah, definitely. And I mean, again, sorry that we uh, didn't really have too, too much time for the discussion without quick. I had to go through some of that stuff, but um, yeah, I'm definitely open to having that conversation with people. I think it's an important one to have. Um, as I mentioned kind of here in my notes, just briefly on this slide, you know, it does tend to be the case. I'm, I'm generalizing a bit, but a lot of times people on the preclinical side of things, especially doing rotated work um, in the neuro field, at least I know, it's nice to think that you can kind of compartmentalize all these different kinds of cells into specific groups that have a few very unique and distinct genetic markers that completely define and describe the kind of functionality or phenotype that you want to associate with these neurons and these circuits in terms of how they're transducing information and driving behavior. But, you know, even looking at some of these plots that the researchers developed and presented here, um, I, I use neuropeptides as an example because I I came from stress-based work uh, in the uh, rodent world, and a lot of uh, that work is constant the idea that markers are like corticotropin releasing factor and other things like that are stress cells. But, you know, there is all more data coming out every day that seems to challenge that belief as to whether or not that's the case. And here they present this very unique profile of these neuropeptides that are used in the mouse at least to define these classes of sensory neurons in the DRG that is shown when they look at their patient population doesn't really overlap at all. It's completely different. So it begs the question of, you know, is it the best case scenario to work backwards from these uh, lower order mammalian models without really a guidepost from human relevant data and then say, okay, we're going to do all this research, and then finally we're going to get to clinical trials and everything fails because it actually turns out that these sectors or these targets that we're going after just don't show up in the human at all, and we're not really actually hitting anything. I mean, I think, I mean, it really argues for probably doing important parallel and back and forth mm. and backward translation so that we really have an idea of what models or what parts of models or what pieces of models you know, might be able to save us time and money, and then what others will not, even though they're very interesting in their own right, but that they wouldn't be expected to provide good translation. This is a naive question on my part. I know that obviously people are always on the search holy grail for obviously non-addicting opioid analgesics and have been able to try to do some parsing of downstream pathways that would, you know, avoid quote unquote addiction or respiratory depression while maintaining analgesia, these kinds of cellular, very granular examinations uh, take, take that a step farther. Do you know of any pharmacologic manipulations that are selective enough to be able to go after these cell types? So I think that's kind of the, I, I don't know 100% myself with absolute certainty what's going on in the drug development world at all levels in those areas. But I do know that, you know, this is kind of the kind of work that people are interested in trying to yeah, do, which is pursuing things like orphan receptors or understudied classes of GPCRs, understudied right. classes of ion channels that could have a cognate, you know, ligand or like an antagonist or a um, partial agonist or something like that developed against it to target right. it and hopefully regulate its activity that would then avoid targeting things like the opioid receptor or some of these other typical opioidergic based receptors that we don't have a lot of problems if you're not selective in where you're specifically targeting them and how long and how much is uh, getting in there into these different parts of the brain. So I think that that's kind of the direction. Actually, I don't have any direct examples of uh, candidates. Yeah, I, just, I, I, know, I, mean, I know that that would be the, that is the, the grail, the holy goal. It's it basically to get there, to be able to do that kind of very elegant, specific parsing. And so I'm just always asking selfishly if there's something that looks like it's around the corner or, or something that would be close to being able to implement. I'll shut up for a moment because I know you do have some people who were hardy and stuck throughout this whole thing and may have a question or two for you. Anyone else? I know we're a little bit past four, but I so appreciate the, the elegant laying out of all of these data and the background. Uh, obviously for an area that's pretty specialized, so I appreciate you bringing it to us and letting it wash across us, and some of it will take. <laughs> yeah, Anyone sorry, here? What did you everyone. think about the I'll ask you quickly about the male-female differences. I noticed on your violin plots that the females seem to have, there was one type of proprioceptive cell that was just very abundant in females, but almost absent in males. I mean, the, the, some of those differences were pretty striking in the males and females. I think they were, yeah, and I think that they focused in primarily on the group that had the highest number of differentially expressed genes exclusively, I, I think because 
those pregenic receptors uh, do have some correlation with nociceptors as well. They tend to be involved in itch-based perception and um, other forms of noxious stimuli-based perception. So I think in their mind, yeah, maybe they were going after exactly what you were mentioning here, was to see if they could parse out a class that might be more related in the regulation of pain or different kinds of noxious uh, stimuli detection and see if they could work up a more elegant profile of it to say, ah, maybe these genes are much more highly expressed either in male or female uh, subjects, but overall, there might be some of these genes that are more highly prevalent in this population when compared to these others. And this might inform, like you were saying before, some kind of potential targets that we could go after and maybe work up a little bit more preclinically before we take some kind of um, you know, novel compound do preclinical trials, but have more confidence that maybe it could have more traction there. Well, it's an elegant uh, sort of outlaying of material that shows this heterogeneity that's really important and also the complexity that's just really sort of always, at least for those of us who are doing, you know, large <laughs> millions of neurons sorts of um, capture with our MRI signals or our even our PET signals, we we don't have the, the luxury of a single cell. So thank you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, thank you guys. And again, uh, sorry for coming so close there. All right. Thank you all very much for hanging in and we'll see you the next time. <laughs>